Okay, just give me a sec here, guys. YouTube was having some crappy technical difficulties on me. So, uh, yeah, let me get a Jimmy in here real quick. And let me go find the stream. Chat. See, this is what happens when we stream at an earlier time. Everything goes to crap. So let me uh, delete the old one if I can. Delete. There. Perfect. Hey, Nathan, what's up? What's up, Eddie? Sorry about that, guys. I think I sent Jimmy the link. He should be on in just a sec. Jimmy, where, where are you, buddy? Wayne all. Started, oh, you, you started a new stream? I had to start a new stream. Did you tell everybody in the chat you started a new stream? Ah, shoot, no. What's it? Send me, send me the link to the new, uh, the new, uh, I, I got to find it too. Man, you make everything difficult. I'm going to Google for this one because I told them I was going to start the stream today and it never gave me a, a uh, live okay. one. So that's on YouTube, not me as far as I'm concerned. I'm sorry. It's all on you. Riot. Just like this Shush. video. Shush. <laughs> okay. Now let me share. Well, also I noticed uh, Apyro Design is having some issues. So. Oh, really? Yeah, he had to run like three different things before he got it to work, but I don't know if he was doing it through a third-party hangout or something like that. So whatever. We're live. That's the big thing. Sorry about the mix-up again, guys. Whatever, whatever. One sec, got to check something here. Uh, it's not working. I'm just going to avoid it. Uh, work great. This is what happens when we stream earlier. Bad things happen. R.I.P. Uh, headphone users. I can get away with it. <laughs> so Ken yeah, was asking, says he has the first question. Have I resolved the PET issue? Well, here's a to give you guys an idea. This is a PET G print. So uh, let's see how strong it is. Got to break, but here's the problem. That was printed at 250 degrees C, but Look at that top surface layer. I mean, sorry if it's a little bit blurry, but it seriously looks like absolute garbage. Yeah. Which film is that one? Uh, Matter Hacker's Build Series PETG. Of which, mind you, I'm still waiting for Matter Hackers to contact me on Twitter or email me after like getting 50,000 notifications probably on Twitter. But the conclusion that we came to unofficially is um, the spool that I have here is probably contaminated. Because when I print with this, it literally smells like I'm holding a hairdryer to a handful of Sharpies. It smells absolutely rank. And PETG, when you're printing, Normally, it doesn't smell like anything. And I've printed it in both black and clear Tolman PETG and never had any odor issues. So if you guys are, if any of you know the, what the code of the batch number is, and this is pure speculation on my part, my batch number says 2017-04-27-1. I'm pretty darn sure that means that this spool was produced in on... Um, in on April uh, 27th of 2017. Mm. So if that is the case, then this spool has been sitting a year. I don't know what the shelf life of PETG is, but let's just say when I pulled this out of the bag, it was already giving me printing issues. I tried drawing it. I tried doing everything like that. So as of now, and this is subject to change, and I'm not saying this is a review. I'm just saying... This has been my experience so far with the Matter Hackers Build Series PETG. 
in the current condition of the spool and given the current printing problems that I've had with it, mind you, I, su I highly suspect this is a spool with some contamination and I really hope Matter Hackers is nice enough to at least exchange it um, because it is absolutely unprintable as is. I mean, I have, this is the um, part of the spool that I printed for the cling wrap holder and this was printed a little bit colder, so it looks absolutely amazing. But the problem is, <laughs> I can't do that with the PLA print. If I keep doing that, yeah, I already cut my hand a little bit. But you get the idea. It looks really good, but then it's got absolutely zero strength. Because what happened when I tried to um, screw everything together is literally the threaded part just literally just snapped in my hand it was like pop and i'm like that's not supposed to do that i mean bigger thicker parts like this is well i was able to snap that i mean can't tell me that's not terrible layer bonding but the rest of the print looks really good so you know until i get official word from matter hackers about what to do i don't know but all i can come on, say dave. Is, come on dave I mean, all I will say is currently I am very, very, very disappointed in the spool that I got. That said, if they do exchange the spool with me, I will try it again and I will see if I have better luck. That said, I have resorted to buying some uh, protopasta black HGPLA and I'm going to use that to print my uh, camera rigs with and kneel it so it's got all the heat stuff which actually makes it have a higher uh, heat deflection than um, PETG so yay there but I still want to try and get the PETG a shot because I spent like a good 40 bucks for a kilo of what ended up being so far hey, 40 bucks for a kilo is not bad <laughs> so, oh that's right that was another stream that was another stream. So in short, guys, that's what's up with me and the PETG. Um, I'm going to probably get in touch with uh, Dave over at Matter Hackers and see what he says. But um, quite I frankly, think, Dave, I think Dave's going to take care of you. I hope so. But quite frankly, it is a little bit disappointing when you're on Twitter and a giant conversation pops up and then it's absolute crickets from them when they've been tagged in it. And bigwig people who are kind of like in – their inner circle start commenting in who are not employees you know so you know that's that's that but at least in the good news department the thingomatic has just been absolutely smashing out protopasta copper and a couple of stainless steel as well maker coins for maker fair so if you guys see me at maker fair you get a protopasta copper or I'm gonna have a couple of stainless if you really want one, coins. They're not gonna be polished polished, but I am going to at least hit them down with a wire brush. So it's kind of like a polish and weather your own coin, make it your own sort of deal. But I figured being that uh, I received some samples of the filament, it was only fair that I made some coins to pass out at the event, so why not? Calvin Witt. The Oprah went free of the 3D Maker coins. <laughs> you get a coin. You get a coin. Everybody Thanks gets for a coin. My thunder. <laughs> What's that? Thanks for stealing my thunder. I was going to be all like, and you get a coin, and you get a coin in chat. You get a coin in chat. You know. <laughs> so while we're still on the general topic, before we dive into the main one. Um, you had mentioned that you're probably only going to be able to make it out on Saturday, you think? Yeah, I think it's just going to be Saturday. Okay, which which is a bummer, but um, my... I know, but in the position I'm in now, I, I've i got to be there. No, I'm, no, that's... that's I, as it is, I was hoping to get this coming Saturday. See, I had everything all planned up before I got this new job. So I was going to go... This coming Saturday to the, the uh, Mini Maker Fair in Santa Cruz, and uh, just the way things are panning out, that's not going to happen. In fact, I don't even think I'm going to get a second day off this week. I think I'll probably just take uh, two half days. <laughs> <laughs> I 
That's a bummer. But do note that uh, my lovely production assistant does want to interview you while we are over there. So that should be fun. I think it's about to wear a cup because she's going to kick me where it hurts. <laughs> You've been mean to Calvin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, this episode of Jimmy Gets Ready for Maker Fair. Yeah, that's what I'm printing, guys. Don't even ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the G Tech uh, A30 printed that last night. Turned out pretty good, huh? For a okay. first print. Hold it up again. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that right there. Look at that. Okay, nobody can see it. It's all blurry. <laughs> <clears throat> no, for for a first print straight off the SD card, that is actually really, really impressive. So yeah, I was very impressed with that. I'm. The only thing that, that bothers me, which I was talking with Chris about it, just you know, getting his feedback on it, was the white stepper motor got pretty hot. And I was asking him, do you think any of the adjustable voltage? He says, honestly, I don't think so. He says it's just mainly because the the weight of the print bed is just really putting a drag on it. That makes sense. I mean, those there's a lot of momentum there to get started and stop, especially if you start doing like a Joel size print on there. Like I was telling you, like I was telling Jimmy before the stream, if it's really become a, a issue of concern, the amount of heat in the motor in terms of causing, you know, it to actually physically overheat and begin to damage the magnets, that's a concern. Get a small little CPU cooler with a fan on it, set it on there, and that might actually provide just enough passive, uh, more like active cooling to help draw some of the heat out and might just work. Yeah, it might. I'm not super worried about it, but it's just uh, one thing that I was kind of was wondering if maybe just in a voltage, but he said not. Nah, I wouldn't just the voltage, just leave it. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I would say for the sake of um, testing, keep it as is, but do make note of it and then maybe do a video about how you go around and fix it. Wouldn't be a bad idea. Yeah. Nathan Allen says fans are our friends. Now, if you're printing ABS or the ETG, they don't like fans. I've used a fan on PETG before. It worked fine. Yeah, but I'm talking you can't go like ridiculous, ridiculous amounts of cooling because it likes the previous layer being kind of warm for optimum sticking. Oh, does it? Yeah. For optimum yeah. stickiness? Yeah, for optimum layer stickiness, don't go, you know, um, running it super cold, but whatever, you know, then again, it's like bigger parts. You can get away with less fans, even in PLA. If I'm doing a really big part, there are sometimes where I will run minimal to no fans just because I know by the time that head gets around, you know, it's not going to be an issue. Okay. So anything else you want to talk about? Well, I figured after I check, um, Oh, thanks, uh, Rover, for the address. I will be gladly sending you a little swag pack. Okay, so here's the other thing we were going to talk about before we talk about the topic, because, you know, <laughs> we're great at not staying on topic, and we're already 17 minutes in, and we already yapped about crappy PETG, dogs, overheating steppers, maker <laughs> fair. Jeez, Jimmy, are you sure you didn't just have a $5 box of Taco Bell? Are you sure you didn't go around, like, the backside of it and get some stuff? No. <laughs> sure? No, I didn't. <laughs> don't make don't make me get that. Besides, that would be up. next door. It wouldn't be behind it. <laughs> hey, don't make me call up Beth and get her to pee for you to pee in a cup and need to double check. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no. So here's the other thing. Um, as you guys may have noticed, things have been a bit crazy with my production schedule here. I haven't been able to be on the show as much as I would have liked to. And a huge thank you to everybody, Joel, Walter, um, 
who else has stepped in for me the last month or so that I haven't been able to be on? I forget. Let's see. I had Joel one time. Then I had uh, uh, Country 3D. He, he came on uh, last week. I think that's been about it. And I think you did one by yourself. You Yeah, yeah. you did stream all by yourself without me. Thanks a lot. No. So, <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I genuinely feel bad for Jimmy because what would happen is, um, I'll go into the details of it shortly, but what would pretty much happen is it would be like a couple hours before the stream and I'd message him and just be like, hey, there's just no way that I can make it on. Uh, and I felt bad because he would be busy at work, so he wouldn't be able to check his messages. So he'd literally have like an hour and a half till the show started, and then he would get the message from me and going, uh, oh, great. So then poor Jimmy would have to like run around and try and find like a last minute co-host, of which that's the reason why I'm really grateful for everybody who stepped up to help out with that. Um, really, really, really appreciate it again, guys. But so here's the reason why I haven't been able to make it on. Last month, I drove the first U-Haul truck with my grandmother's um, possessions in it down to Southern California, where she is now currently living near my family. If you guys don't know, I took, helped take care of her for over four years, and I'm actually in her house right now, uh, where I've been filming Make It With Calvin for all of the shows where you see me sitting here. This is in my bedroom at my grandmother's house. So... Sadly, she got, um, she's still mobile, still getting around and stuff, but the house that she currently, the house she was living in, my dad just was not suitable for her. So my family decided it was best to move her closer, which I felt was a good idea. So dealing with the whole family thing, scheduling stuff, taking things down, just the mental, emotional stuff of dealing with the move and things like that was really difficult on top of full time in school and applying to another school to hopefully transfer into a design program. Things have been really crazy. So I'm sorry if things have been kind of like, you know, a little bit off with my schedule, not being able to make it on, but there were just certain nights where I just knew that there was no way that I could get out of the mental rut that I was in. Maybe I had some issues with family er earlier in the day. and I just couldn't, couldn't get myself in the mindset, so I feel sad that I wasn't able to make it on. But I really appreciate all of you guys, um, including Jimmy, who's been who have been really gracious, who have known what's going on behind the scenes and helped uh, in their own little ways. So I appreciate it. But thankfully, um, my grandmother is now happier down south near near my parents. So. Now that all that's behind me, now I can hopefully get back to focusing on school, the show, Maker Fair, upcoming adventures, things like that. So that's just a little uh, update for you guys there. That was definitely a challenging time to go through, but we are back hopefully to some semblance of normal and also have an earlier show time. <laughs> well, earlier show time is because of me. <laughs> yeah, well, that too. Everybody's there's it's like 50 50. Some people hate it, some people like it. Yeah, I mean, honestly, <laughs> I'll be honest, it goes both ways. I totally liked the later streaming time because then I had more time to crank out projects and crap before the stream started, but at the same time, I like it earlier because then I'm not getting to bed at midnight. Da, da, da. So, you know, yeah, yeah, the this. Actually, getting up at six thirty in the morning. We used to. I'd, I'd wake up at six thirty. Now I'm getting up at six thirty. Have to be up there by seven thirty when they open the doors to the store. I'm the first one of the first ones in, I, in my department. I'm the first one in. I'm the last one to leave. <laughs> and and I won't say everything that Jimmy. I won't say what Jimmy has told me that he knows how to do over at the store. But let's just say that if Jimmy quit one day, he would be screwed. We walked up to the day and the lights were on. And everybody's like, how come the lights are on? I said, because I don't turn them off anymore. <laughs> yeah, if that doesn't explain the level of stuff that Jimmy was doing behind the scenes, I don't know what does. <laughs> I still had to set up the Facebook ad for this weekend. <laughs> oh, jeez. 
for two stores. <laughs> oh man, busy, busy guy. How long till you're gonna be managing the uh, Thousand Oaks store if it still exists? What's that? How long till you're gonna be managing the Thousand Oaks store if it still exists? I am never going down to Thousand Oaks. Of course, I also said I'd never work for this company, and that was about 16 years ago. <laughs> Watch three months from now, Jimmy's going to be like, "Yeah, so here I'm in Thousand Oaks, and I just, you know, some I see Deb's place, and you know, I totally like took the dots in, and <laughs> that grandma, you know, it was great." <laughs> okay, let's get on your subject. What was the subject tonight? I never did. I thought we were going to be grilling a company, and then all of a sudden, now you're talking about building a printer. <laughs> well, being that I haven't heard back from the company yet about the filament, I decided that it was probably better to just. Dive into the topic that Rick uh, mentioned on Twitter. You might know him from the chat. He made a really good point. He goes, what? Well, GTEC just came out with their effectively, I'm going to call it spinoff of the CR10. Oh, yeah. I don't know. There's, no, there's not even an argument. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> and I'm only calling it a spinoff because it's a, you know, it's a moving Y-axis gantry 3D printer. Right. There's only so many ways you can package the same thing and have it be different. The only difference I can think of is make it like a form bot where, oh, gee, the electronics are strapped to the side, not on a little external widget that's floating out there, which is not my favorite. But besides the point, the thing is, and then you could also say it's a spinoff of the G Max. But like I said, the whole point is. Yeah, let's face it, the G Max is the original large form printer. Oh, yeah. And I have to say, after seeing Jeff's machine, I think it's pretty nice. Yeah, it is. <laughs> JT says they're all I3 style. Yes, but yep. I think if it was to be more technical, I believe the term would be the, the moving Y-axis gantry uh, CNC, uh, CNC platform. I'm calling it CNC platform because technically a 3D printer is a CNC machine. It stands for Computer Numerical Control. It's the attachments that you add onto it, either make it a milling machine, a router, a laser cutter, a vinyl cutter, a 3D printer. You get the point. Yeah. But it's the motion platform itself is what I'm talking about. But well, I this, this style is considered an I3 format. Um, but I believe these are what, Cartesian? Yeah. That Like the ones behind you there are considered Cartesian because the print head does all the moving, including the... Well, the print bed drops usually, but the the X and the Y is controlled by the just the the print bed, the print head. The Ultimaker would be Cartesian. The Trinus would be the moving Y-axis gantry, I believe. And then the thing Thingomatic is like in a realm all of its own with the bed moving in X and Y and then the Z-axis. This one is modeled off a full size CNC machine. Those two are their own separate thing, although there are quite a lot of large format CNC milling machines that use this same style of setup for really heavy duty milling. It's um, it's pretty interesting. If you watch my Haas tour video, I think about halfway through, they show one of the giant machines and they just like drop a giant casting on and yeah, 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 yeah. munch right through it. It's pretty cool. Ken says the Ultimaker is considered a quad wrap. Okay, thanks. I honestly, I am basing this knowledge off stuff I read years ago in a robotics book. I haven't, I don't know all the technical, technical terms of everything. And I think to an extent, some of the terms might be more 3D printing specific. Although I would not be surprised if there were not commercial machines with motion platforms similar to that design. So I'm not an expert. I'm not an engineer. I don't have a degree in kinematics or anything like that. So I'm just basing it off how I see it. So what is it you're wanting to talk to, but talk about it when it comes to the CR10, GTEC, large format printer, thing watchies? The point, the thing that I was going to in a sense, and we're going to also dive into that fun world of what is your time worth. Really wanted to see, Rick made a good point though. He goes, I wonder if it's cheaper to just say buy a CR10 or a spinoff of it or build your own. And that actually got really interesting when I started researching. I did not have time to dig up prices for every single component. That would just be a bit ridiculous. But in the 
description section, I do have a list of items that I linked to on Amazon, and these are not, and open builds as well, these are not me endorsing the products. This was just me looking for what's a popular item to get a price point of, you know, for comparison's sake. And I need to actually sit down and do the math on it. But how much does the CR10 um, run for, I think? I think the CR10 runs right around 420, if I remember right. How much is the uh, <laughs> GTEC? GTEC uh, runs, I believe, uh, 4 459. I think that some places have like for 429 somewhere in there. So you're talking about the same price. 400 ish. Uh, I'd, I'd say about 400 because I'm sure there'll be sell prices, coupon codes, whatever. Yeah, we'll just use 400 for easy math here. So let me um, dig up my links. Really just, just going out on a limb without even looking up the prices for everything, I would say you'd be hard-pressed to actually build one for less than 350 That's what I was thinking, too. And obviously, I don't know how many feet of extrusion you're going to need or anything like that. But um, let me just dig up and I won't do screen share because you guys can call up everything in the chat. But here's something to keep in mind. Five NEMA 17 motors on Amazon, just the motors, no drivers. They do come with a cable. Five of those will add um, 40 Newton centimeters of torque, um, which is a respectable amount of torque will run you 50 bucks. If you want to get the 59 Newton centimeters, which I don't think 19 Newton centimeters makes that much difference, that'll run you 60 bucks. But we'll just use the 50 for easy math here. So you're already 50 bucks in for five stepper motors, two okay. for the Z axis, one for the Y axis, one for the X axis, and one for your um, extruder. extruder. Right. I mean, beefy extruder, but it's bone, so you need it. Then the electronics package, which has a measly eight-inch heated bed, but we don't really care in this application. The control electronics and everything like that. And, um, oh, wow, they're so generous. They give you uh, two pulleys and a belt, but no idlers. That will run you 45 bucks. We'll call that 50 for easy math right there. You're already up to $100 just for the electronics, and we haven't even thrown a power supply in there. Which probably oh, is so are you talking about a board? Talking to board and drivers, LCD, and heat a bed. And then you also need a cable kit. True. Although the, and that includes the uh, end stops, although the steppers did come with cables, you, you would need to make your own harnesses. But yeah, then there's that. Then if you want to go really cheap here, because we're trying to do this as you know, low cost as we can, you can get a key pang all metal V6J hot end, aka E3D clone Bowden setup for a whopping $13 shipped with three and a half stars on Amazon. So, you know, we're, we're going cheap here. And then from the same company, you can get a three star $11 extruder. So, what are we up to now? We'll just say it was 50 for the electronics plus 50 for the drivers plus what do you want to say for a power supply? 30 bucks because we're not going to do a heat of bed. You, you have to do a, a heat of bed. The CR10 is the heat of bed, right? Yeah, then we'll do 50 bucks for a nice beefy power supply. It's for easy math Which here. You need, to find a, you need to find a 300 or a 320 millimeter heated bed. You can do that in a minute. So currently, according to my calculator, we're up to $150 just for electronics. Haven't even thrown a heated bed in there, so I'm going to get that in a minute. Plus, you we'll just say a 15 dollars Double that price. What? I said you're going to double that price. Plus, we'll just say 15 bucks for a cheap hot end. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm rounding here slightly, guys, just for the sake of fairness and math. The point is we're not trying to like price everything out perfectly. It's just to get an approximate. Um, so would you say a 320 millimeter heated bed? Oh, if you want a 320 by 320 
millimeter borosilicate glass plate, that'll only run you 42 bucks for a 3D printer. That's just the glass though, right? Yeah. So we'll just add a 50 bucks for the glass just for easy math because borosilicate glass is not cheap. See if you, you can find an aluminum uh, heated bed. And then you wouldn't even have to worry about the heated glass. You just put or the glass. You just put a piece of build tech on the aluminum. Yeah. Might save you a little bit of money. Of course, then well, again, the build tech is going to cost you as much as the glass. Yeah. Well, personally, I like the idea of having a removable build plate. So if something gets stuck, you can at least throw the plate out. True. Um, okay. So if you want a wit box heated bed, a 300 by 300, is that close enough? Yeah, you're 20 millimeters short. Well, it's the closest I can find so far. Ladies. <laughs> Suck. 20 millimeters, yeah. man. <laughs> That'll run you another uh, 50 bucks, so we're up to $265 already. Now, aluminum extrusion. Yeah, that will run you... Hmm. They sell it by the inch? I'm looking that up. Can you can you easily measure how many uh, millimeters of extrusion are on that printer? I can measure your inches. You're 23 inches tall on the two uprights. The two on the sides are 19 inches. Then you go down to the smaller extrusions, which are the what? Okay, so what was that again? It was what was it? Two at what was it? Uh, 23 inches for two. And then two okay. at 19 inches, and these are the 20 by 40 extrusions or 20 by something. It's this type. Two at, two at 23 plus two at. Sorry, my brain's a little slow tonight. What was it? All right. Sorry, I zoned out there for a second. What was it? <laughs> yeah, I can tell. <laughs> I'm like waiting for you to get me nervous, and I'm like, you know. like, are you having a silent stroke or what over there? You're like, <laughs> no, guys, I'm not dead yet. Don't worry. So, so it was two at twenty three, and then two at sixteen. Take care, Nathan. Thanks for joining. <laughs> what was it two at twenty three, two at sixteen? Um, two at nineteen, two at twenty three, on the larger extrusion. That's the smaller extrusions. There's seven, two at 17, two at 20. It's actually 20 and a half. Let's call 21. Okay, well, you theoretically need 3,302 millimeters of extrusion. The closest I can get for easy math is it is sixteen dollars for fifteen hundred millimeters of v slot rail cutting it yourself so we'll just say that's another 30 bucks okay so we're up to 290 we're up to just under 300 295 now you have to have a belt and uh you need the belt, belt, you need the access uh, rods, you need idler bushings, you need hardware. Do we just want to call that a simple 50 bucks because it all adds? Oh, you also need wheels and plates. And bearings. Yeah. Let's just see uh, how much the V-slot plates are to get an idea. Eh, they're not too bad. They're about like 8 to 10 bucks a piece. Do we just want to call it, What do we want to call that whole lot for easy math? Like the, all of the sundries per se. I have no clue. You just want to call it rods. The, this is using uh, what do you call them? Uh, lead the screws. Self, yeah, it's using the self compensating nuts. Do you want to just say another hundred bucks for everything else? Just to call it easy math. Yeah, last time I checked out lead screws, they weren't cheap. Need twenty one inch uh, lead screws. Two of them. Let me go see what they run at McMaster. And this also has the anti backlash uh, nuts on them. Working on that. Okay, so mind you, we're looking at actual lead screws here. We're not looking at, hi, I went to uh, 
Osh and Boston. Kevin's, I agree with Kevin. He's, he's closer to 90 for just the lead screws. Okay. Well, let me just see here really fast. You it's want probably more lead screws, but I think the lead screw is going to be about 60 or 70. What size do you think in America those lead screws are? Probably three eighths of an inch? Yep. That'd be about right. Okay. So if you want a, and then how many feet would do the trick? Six feet uh, total? It was a two at 21 inches. Okay. We'll just say uh, six feet total because that's the next size up comes at McMaster. For six feet of screw, you're looking at 30 bucks right there. Then you need the nuts. So we'll just go plus 30. What nuts? These nuts. <laughs> here I am, I'm searching McMaster, and here I had you, Al. <laughs> These nuts. <laughs> oh, man. This is the crap I have to put up with, guys. Uh, you know, I'm just kidding. Um, let me just see. JT's got to go. Take care, JT. Have a good one. Sorry, guys, if I'm not like on chat right now. It's because I'm crawling all over the internet, pricing out this wonderful cluster. Says, Don't forget delivery costs. Yeah, well, I'm doing this in a perfectly theoretical theoretical world. How about that? Okay, this is where you're going to get pricing. Um, if you want the, this is not the same, exactly, exactly the same as yours, but this is very close, the style of nuts that you've got. Those will, if you want good self-compensating nuts for backlash and wear and stuff, those things will run you like 30 bucks a piece at least. Yeah, that's a lot of money right there. So let's, let's, just, let's just price it with regular nuts. Fine. Regular nuts, we'll just say like two bucks. That's going to be more than two bucks for nuts. Five bucks. On McMaster? I'm talking like the ones that they recommended coming with those lead screws. For your 3 8 by 10 steel nut, you're looking at three bucks a piece. That's just a nut. That. That's not the type of they have the tapped deals for the hooking on to the metal carriage. I'm just looking at. Oh yeah. Well, okay, fine. You want to just say fifty bucks for the nuts, just because we're doing easy math here. Sure. It's fifty, so we're now to three seventy-five. We still need the um, couplers. Those things are not cheap. I think you can get the nuts cheaper than 50 though. You need to knock that down to about 20 bucks. Fine. Well, there's always going to be room for discrepancy in all this. So how about that? All right. I'm just going to guess here the size. Okay. This is, mind you, this is McMaster. So the pricing is not exactly going to be 100% accurate, but... To get nice set screw precision flexible shaft couplings that aren't going to add a bunch of backlash to your machine, they're going to run you about 40 bucks a piece. I'm just going to go 50 bucks as well because I know I can get them cheaper elsewhere, but they're not cheap. We're now up to 425. And now you're you're talking about not even a kit. You've got to assemble this thing from scratch. You got to cut everything yourself. You got to solder it all yourself. You got to come up with firmware yourself. You could probably find firmware that's close, but you still got to build it yourself. Mr. Kill Science says again, how much would, will you spend on upgrades to make your kit safe? Well, I mean, you got here's the thing to remember, guys. We're pricing this out as if somebody's just rolling into their computer like, hey, I want to build a printer. And, you know, they don't really know what they're doing. So that said, obviously, the price is going to be up and down depending upon um, 
what you get and from where, but according to our math, let's just say we rolled in at $400 for all the equipment, which to me, for a machine of that size, is pretty reasonable. King Random's saying, which I agree with him, they aren't, you aren't comparing apples to apples. Quality McMaster is going to be much better. Now, that's true. But the thing to remember is if you're building your own machine from scratch, if I was doing that and I had a decent budget, I would be buying, like, I guess, self-compensating, self-lubricating lead screw assemblies. I'd be buying good quality equipment to make this machine as good as it could be versus buying a um, lower cost machine and trying to upgrade it. So I'm kind of taking that approach. But yeah, there's like, like I said, there's so many different ways you can put this together. This is just an example of using off the shelf stuff, you know, not bargain hunting while we're at it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And Eddie goes, yeah, you can get good parts way cheaper than your listing. And that is true. But at the same time, I am taking it a little bit from the approach of this is somebody who's, you know, just rolling into it. But one thing that we didn't consider is if you need to make any um, custom parts yourself, man, that's really going to drive the cost up. If you have to farm the work out to somebody, let's just pretend you do have a little garage shop, still got to crank something out. That's going to take a while, say a custom plate or something like that and you can't 3d print it because you're building your printer from scratch right that's so, the reason why i think these these printers the cr10 the g tech for the money they're actually if you're getting started into 3d printing that's a good a good and a good angle to start from yeah so i'll be honest when i first got into it i had the mentality of oh gee i could just build my own machine i work in a machine shop blah 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 uh, and then I really thought, sat down and thought about it. I'm like, no. One day I took and I sat down. And I was trying to figure out which would be cheaper. And I actually went on, priced everything out. And when I got done pricing everything out, it just wasn't, it wasn't cost effective to build my own machine. It was like, just buy it. And pretty much then it's already programmed. You don't have to, you know, everything's cut the way it's supposed to be. I mean, even for a kit printer, everything is, you know, as long as you buy a reasonably decent kit, you're better off than just buying all your own parts, especially for your first one. It's one thing later on when you're, when you're used to 3D printing and you kind of got the gist of what it takes to build one, then, you know, you can probably get away with it. Be with that, you're not going to cheap out. You're not going to buy the cheapest stuff you can get. No, if you're going to be building, let's just put it this way. If you're somebody who's going to be building their own machine from scratch and they know what they're doing, they're intentionally going to put in, they're going to err more on the side of buying the quality components from the get-go versus trying to upgrade a pre-existing product. Now, King Random said uh, you wouldn't be building a machine before owning one. I slightly disagree with that only because I'm coming at this from the standpoint of somebody who has some manufacturing knowledge or has connections to people who can help produce the parts, has a decent design background and says to themselves, Hmm, I'd actually want to try and build my own machine from scratch being that there's so many plans out there. There's so many digital resources. I can download Marlin firmware and modify it to fit my build volume, blah, 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 blah. That's the mentality I'm taking of. But at the same time, the other point we're trying to make here is, is it really cheaper to build or buy? And there's always going to be wiggle room. But in my opinion, unless you're able to build something like the printer bot simple, the wooden machine, so you have access to a laser cutter at your job and you just buy grab bags of components off China eBay page or something, might be able to crank something out for dirt cheap, but I really don't think that it's, you know, unless you're doing it as a learning experience, I really don't think it's worth it. I think, you know? I think you're, you're wrong about the fact that somebody with the knowledge is going to, for their very first pair, going to build one. I agree with King Random. I agree with Eddie. It's 1% is going to take and actually for their very first printer, go and buy all the parts and build their printer for the very first time. 
99% of the people, I actually think it's 99.9% .9 of the people are going to either buy a kit or they're going to buy a machine that's pre-built. And I, right now, the way the, the price differences between the kit and a machine that's nearly completely built, they're going to go for the ones nearly completely built. Yeah. Now, mind you, I do come from a background of looking at something and going, I can just build it on my own. Which obviously you did make a good point there. So I'm taking a definite extreme angle here, but even then, let's just say somebody had a machine and then decides to build their own. At the end of the day, the economics of it to me just doesn't make much sense, being that you can't buy things wholesale for the prices that you can that these companies can, if you know what I mean. The thing is, I, I am a firm believer in a person's time is worth some money. Oh yeah. So you go and you buy your parts and you wait for the shipping for all the different parts to come from all the different places that you buy it from and put that on your desk. And then you take somebody who buys a machine and it's here in a matter of three or four days. Are you going to have all your parts there and assemble it in three or four days compared to the guy that's going to pull one out of the box and have it printing in an hour? Probably not. Now, one thing I will say to kind of make you guys understand a little bit more of the reason why I am the way that I am when it comes to this stuff. Up until I think it was like ninth grade, every single year I would do a science fair project. And I'm talking decently complex stuff. Like one year I built a water pump from plumbing parts at the hardware store. I built a self-contained battery, car battery and car cooling fan powered hovercraft on a four by eight sheet of plywood. Another year I built a wind tunnel, with the wing inside powered by a desk fan. So I guess in a sense, I kind of come from the attitude of, I see something cool, I'm gonna try and duplicate it on my own. Back when I was doing that, I was definitely with adult supervision and help. But the point, oh, and another year I built a underwater robot using some surplus motors and plumbing parts. So you kind of guys understand a little bit more of where I'm coming from. But yeah, that is a good point. But I'm, I guess I'm kind of taking it from the perspective of a hobbyist person going, I got all the time in the world. I want to try and build something. But yes, you definitely will not get the same experience out of either way. But at the same time, it does make sense, though, that a lot of people would err on the side of build, you know, build a kit or buy a almost pre-assembled, but at the end of the day, everybody has their own choice to make. So, you know. Yeah. And yes, I do know that I speak for the minority here, but I figured if we're going to be doing this, we might as well take it from the way extreme end and compare, you know, pretty much compare extreme ends here. Pre-built-ish versus DIY build it and you know see how it works out because at the end of the day that that that's kind of the best way I can think of to compare the two in a way although I know we are definitely at the far extremes here so yeah yeah definitely far extremes <laughs> for comparison's sake you kind of have to do that to really get the point across and also see for yourself wow really that's not what I thought it was going to be, or that's what I thought all along, if you know what I mean. And 3D uh, printer noob is right. You also think about the people who can't afford afford it and would be purchasing stuff bit by bit. That's true. Almost rep wrap it, per se. Heck, for all you know, what somebody does is they go to their local library. Okay, let's just hypothetically here say you're a kid and you have a paper route or you have you know an allowance or you have a small source of income and you want to build a printer so what you do is you go over to your local um makerspace or library get some you know prints done when you get the money you, you make the prints then you save up your money you buy an electronics package you buy a power supply and then pretty much you just rep wrap the machine into existence over time as you either scratch for components or buy them online but that's a real extreme example true 
Although it is completely doable when you think about it. I mean, if you're the kind of person who has um, the resources, I mean, you look at the gold rep wraps that were made from all thread and cut up um, cutting I, boards and stuff. They, I they almost were, bought one of those kits. <laughs> Party of me has wanted to build one on the show just to see how well it works, but I just do not have the time and do not have the space. <laughs> don't have enough threaded rod. <laughs> I actually have a fair bit in the garage and also have some uh, quarter inch steel rod. But yeah, besides the point, I mean, there's, there's, there's like a thousand different ways that you can come at this, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I know, Eddie, that would be cool to watch, although space would be an issue. I mean, I do technically have enough random components theoretically lying around, but I don't know. Wilbot says one of those hanging printers would be pretty cheap. Yeah, but trying to convince your parents to drill holes in the ceiling might not go down so well, but that would be cool. <laughs> Or you could do one of these concrete pumper 3D printers I keep seeing on every, every one of my family members and friends on Facebook. Well, it's always taken any time that thing comes up where it shows it extruding that concrete on these houses. They'll always tag me in it. And it's like, I wouldn't live in it. <laughs> Think about it. A house made with concrete where each layer is on top of another layer with no rebar <laughs> strengthening it. It's just going to be nothing but a weak joint. And here in California, uh, in one earthquake, it'd be like... <laughs> Actually, that's a point that my uh, uncle made when he sent me the link to the video. He goes, how the heck did they get the windows in? And how did they do the plumbing and the electrical? And how strong is it? And I'm like... Thank you. You think exactly like I do. I mean, I'm not saying it's not a cool concept. It's just everybody gets all, oh, my gosh, it's new technology, without thinking, gee whiz, it's an unsupported building. You look at other countries that don't have the same building codes, and you see these buildings just go boom in a minor earthquake, and it's really sad. And I'm like, I really don't want to live in a building that's going to go boom in the first earthquake because, oh, it's the first 3D printed building. I might try to live in a shipping container. Thank you very much. <laughs> the skewed uh, view says they have rebar it, in there. It, a guy that goes around, make sure the rebar is tied up and it prints all the way, all the way up. The videos I've seen, I haven't seen any rebar. I have just one smooth, just run of concrete. Did it of that. The I, problem I, is you have to see one where they actually put rebar into it. Agreed. Now that's not to say that theoretically they couldn't do something a little bit like a mark forged, or they could maybe put um, some kind of reinforcement in there. But I don't know, kind of like a mesh or something, or fill up the void. But still, it's an unsupported concrete building. So well, there must be another video because Eddie saw the same one and they did use rebar. The ones guys, that I have seen that none of them had rebar. You guys find it, post it in the comments, and I'll allow the uh, post to go through. Um, that's interesting though. But the other concern is it's like all your plumbing and electrical is running the wall. So no, you'd have a uh, house like that. You'd have to run it through the floor and just have it come up. True. Unless you run the plumbing on the outside and the bore through the wall. Don't know if that's up to code or not. <laughs> again, we well, I don't think a 3D printed house is up to code anyway. <laughs> I think we kind of figured out the same thing here. Um, 3D printed house, cool concept, but I'm not going in an unreinforced concrete one. And the ones where they're using kind of like the great stuff style expanding polyurethane foam, that's pretty I totally cool. totally one of those. Remember back I mean, years ago, they had where they'd like blow up this dome, and they would they would start out, and then somehow they'd spray it with that stuff, and then pull whatever that was they used for the dome, pull it out of it, and it was like a foam house. That is pretty cool. Now that would be really interesting to see what the thermal 
dynamics of it are like in either a really hot or a really cold environment in terms of being that it's effectively foam insulation, how well does it either keep heat out or keep heat in? That'd be cool. Yeah. And now they have the stuff that they can spray over that foam that gives it like a latex uh, rubber type finish. So it'd hold up to the weather pretty good. Well, we could even shot create the outside maybe. Oh yeah, definitely. You could shot create the outside and then if you really wanted to go all in, you could make it like a green roof where you have dirt and you have like grass and stuff growing on it. So you get extra insulation properties from that. That'd be really cool actually. <laughs> well, Excuse me. Are you Excuse doing me. all right? Are you getting ready to call it? I'll be good for a few more minutes, I think. Mosquito 3 d uh, said there's a lot of different videos out there, but I think it'll be in the States here by 2025 or 2030. Maybe. Probably. By then they'll have it perfected. Yeah. I mean, you could argue, slit, I think it's called slip form casting, where they make like a continuous um, extrusion, if you will, of concrete for silos chimneys um the legs of giant oil and gas platforms that are out in the ocean and stuff you can almost argue in a way that is sort of ish 3d printing but with that it's very slowly moving up so you got wet concrete at the top and then as it goes down the concrete's curing and then you've already got the rebar in there so you got people continuously putting um Rebar in there as it slowly moves the form up. Yeah, I'm surprised they aren't doing that for buildings, but oh, wow. uh, they actually—I forget what country it was in—but they're actually doing it for high raises. Hmm. Every I think it's each week it raises like one story, and then the, the next week it goes up another story. Well, I know when they I built modern, country that was in. Oh, well, I know when they built modern high-rise um, buildings with concrete. Now what they'll do is they'll have the forms on the bottom. So then they'll set the forms up, they'll pour the concrete, and then by the time they're done with that, the previous floor is cured enough that they can take off the stuff, they can go up to the next level, and then it just grows layer by layer. And then as they're doing that, you know, you got the rebar guys, you got the plumbing guys, you got everybody running their lines and stuff. So as they're letting the next layer, everything's ready to go for the next group of guys to run the electrical, windows in, all that stuff. That's cute. No, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Are you saying that I'm rambling tonight and I'm really about to <laughs> No, they're talking about concrete block. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. <clears throat> so did you see uh Simone was it, it Yurtz? Yeah. Did you see her video? Yeah. I mean, I'll I'll be perfectly honest. I might not always be a fan of the way that she, when I say handles herself in terms of dealing with confrontations on social media and some of her political and social views, might not always agree with those and I might not always agree with the stuff that she's working on. But at the same time, um, I genuinely feel for her. That's really, really sad considering she's, um i'm assuming she's in my age group ish or somewhere around there to be that assume assuming she's probably like in her mid 20s early 30s to be dealing with something that serious at that young of an age where you're talking if things go wrong besides the potential for dying you know paralysis on part of your face losing your eyesight you know that's that's really, really serious stuff. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad, and man, my my heart my heart and prayer goes out to her because man, that's that's something to deal with. Thankfully, uh, from what I understand, it it's not cancerous, but at the same time, the the fact that they got to go in there and take it out that's that's just horrible. Yeah, it's um, it's tough. I mean, I've had multiple surgeries to try and correct a growth issue in my leg and that's not fun having your bone cut and having 
plates and screws and rods put in there and taken out. And the worst that could happen with that is I use my leg. You know, anything dealing with your brain or something like that, that's like serious. You know, but at least it's a good thing that she saw a doctor and found out about it now before it became so yeah. big that they're like, sorry, we can't do anything at this point on it. That would right. be the that fact that they really can sad. operate and they're willing to operate this is actually a good sign. Yeah. Because in my case, um, the doctors that I've seen, and I totally respect their opinion regarding my knee. Yes, I'm eventually going to need a knee replacement because my kneecap is wearing out in the upper travel, in the upper range of my travel. It goes bone on bone, and it's very, very uncomfortable. So if you guys see me at Maker Fair looking kind of miserable, it's because of my dang knee. Um, but yeah, doctors don't really want to work on mine yet because I'm still relatively young and the problem is if you know knee replacement goes wrong that's serious but that's still not as serious as brain surgery gone wrong for sure yeah. but you know in my case they just don't want to operate on it yet because they just don't feel like the risk potential is worth it in my case which i feel the same way you know but we'll see but yeah i definitely wish her all the best in that and i hope that it um i hope that it works out in the end for her for the better but mr carol science said she hit a million subs like an hour after posting that yeah her video was number one on trending which is pretty big that's huge yeah knee replacements do wear out and i'm only in my mid 20s right now i really don't want to have four knee replacements ahead of me avoid it and my left knee is not doing that great either so uh maybe at some point we'll do a uh video called uh calvin pimps out his wheelchair oh god <laughs> be running around in a power chair up and make her fair i'll be in my hover around blasting with jet around song like not giving a care in the world <laughs> We can, we can see we can, going. Up, I guess see going up to to Joel bumping up against him. <laughs> I was joking with a friend. I'm like, God forbid I ever have to go into a wheelchair. You know what's going to happen is I'm going to totally like swag the thing out with like a holder for my laptop here. Maybe have my 3D printer on the back. Have uh, some other stuff right here. And she's all like, Oh gosh. I'm like, Don't put it past me. Mr. Carol Science says 3D print a knee replacement. No, no. I have, I okay. Theoretically, I know how to machine a replacement knee for myself. Does not mean that I'm going to even remotely attempt to do it. I mean, I have titanium at home. I have grade five, which is generally used for implants. It's not implant grade though. Theoretically, I could do that, but the reality is I'm not even going to come remotely close to trying. Let alone you trying to invent one that won't you. wear out. What? Why don't you invent one that won't wear out? Yeah, it's a little easier said than done. I mean, shoot, my knee's wearing out. <laughs> I don't claim it. <laughs> no, no, that's not going to no. <laughs> like, Having worked in a machine shop that's made cadaver grade medical prototypes the amount of fda paperwork that we had to sign off on and the insane amount of paperwork that came with the materials was nuts the price of like a piece of titanium like this big regular was like oh five or ten bucks same equivalent piece of medical implant grade you're talking like thousands of dollars so you know well you want to go ahead and call it we'll go ahead and call it I I'm gotta still... go take a shower and go to bed because I'm an old man now. <laughs> you only said you're 44, Denny. I know. <laughs> That's not old fart territory, all right? Old fart territory is like 60 plus. You know how whenever I took this job, I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna like it. I'm yeah. starting to like it. <laughs> you just like sitting in your office and bossing people around and being like, you do this, you do that. I don't do that. I, I do not go in there and boss people around. I don't do it. I go out there and I work with them. I know, I'm just they, they Knowing burn. you, you're like, Mr. Get in there, get your hands dirty. And honestly, 
that to me is like the best kind of management is when the manager is not scared to get in there and not scared to be at the workers level and experience what they're experiencing. Yeah. You know? It was like today the truck showed up. I had two guys in the shop working. I mean, they're working their tails off. I wasn't about to ask one of them to come and help me. I just went out there and unloaded the truck. <laughs> it took me about 20, 30 minutes to get all the tires off, but uh, I just threw them out. And then as soon as I got everything unloaded, because it was a time truck, you have less than an hour to, to unload it. So I go in there, threw everything out, closed the door down, put the new seal on, sent the truck driver on. Then I had stacking tires for another 30 minutes. <laughs> Man, that sounds like a lot of work. Sounds a little bit like downloading the uh, U-Haul. Pretty, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much it was we get it over to Grandma's house in the morning, and we're just like, Wee! you know, it took us like an hour to download a truck that took us like four plus hours to load with the help of a neighbor. We're like six hours to load. Wow. Yeah, that was fun. Ken says, stop scratching my tires. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Well, let's go ahead and call it. All right. We'll go ahead and call it. Thanks again, guys, for jumping on here. Sorry if I'm a little bit out of it tonight. Still kind of mentally um, recovering from everything that's been going on, but glad to be back in the uh, wonderful five-gallon bucket with a couple of pieces of wood on top thrown, yapping at my laptop with a light blurring in my eyes. It's great. <laughs> Well, guys, thank you very much for joining us. And next week, we're over on my channel. We're going to talk about stuff and things and kilos of type stuff, right? That's right. All and hopefully, kilos. All and hopefully kilos. by then, the wonderful PETG nightmare will have figured itself out. And while you're playing with that PETG, I'm going to play with my own PETG. <laughs> nah, I've given up on PETG for now. I'm, I'm going back to PLA. I got burned by it. I think I got to. Yep. Got to roll. <laughs> I had offered to you, but you don't have 1.75. I know. And the great as Clyde the Trinus is right here, his build volume is just way too tiny for the stuff that I'm working on right now, which is a bummer, but oh well. He's hopefully soon going to be getting a, me working on a CNC upgrade for him. Cool. <laughs> yep. Okay, guys, take care. Catch you next time. Have a good one. Thanks for popping in.